Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Kerry. Uh, for a change tonight, it's actually not looking too bad outside. And we had some spectacular nights uh, stargazing over the last two nights. So weather forecast is looking good for the weekend. Um, we have a, a, a great program um, of, of events. Uh, we have people who know their stuff talking about astrophotography. Uh, we have uh, Evie Lam, who, who was one of our speakers earlier on, doing some, uh, some work. And uh, we have a great variety of people, and we're really looking forward to the weekend. Uh, today, we're back to uh, our old stalwart. Uh, um, John is um, going to actually be with us uh, tomorrow uh, in person and will be around for the weekend. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, and fingers crossed, for um, a, a, a great weekend. So if you haven't already checked out the various events and the various uh, things that are going on, please do so. Um, and be aware that in, in the tradition of uh, astronomy, uh, we'll do anything to help anybody in terms of kit they're trying to figure out, work with or whatever. So if you do have any questions over the weekend, ask any of the participants or, or any of the uh, speakers. Uh, the one thing you can be sure of is that people are here to help. So without further ado and uh, anticipating that um, we, we will be hearing this evening what we're hopefully going to see uh, tomorrow evening and Saturday evening uh, for real. Uh, I hand over to John. Thank you, John. Thank, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks, Orla. Thanks, Claudia, for the introduction. And as Steve says, um, there'll be lots of people there over the weekend to give you a helping hand on getting started in the hobby or, or if you need to figure out how to use the telescope or are interested in buying any equipment or like people will give lots of advice. Essentially, we all started somewhere and certainly I floundered around a fair bit for a few years until I joined an astronomy club and there I found lots of people willing to help this budding young amateur astronomer to I'm not young anymore, of course, but um, to get started and basically learn my way around the sky. But as Steve said, um, the forecast is looking very good for the weekend and there's certainly lots to see. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, share my screen there and uh, basically just switch over to that and hopefully um, everyone can see that there. The, um, I, basically I'll, I'll kick off with uh, just a, a view of um, the, the planets this month are really all in the morning sky. Jupiter has disappeared from view in the evening sky but if you're up early in the morning, and certainly over the last few weeks, and it was clear you, you couldn't miss Venus dazzling bright in the southeastern sky ahead of sunrise. And on the morning of March 28th, um, this particular photo is from a couple of years ago, but on March 28th, we'll see a similar scene where the waning crescent moon just a couple of days before new will appear close to the planet Venus. The um, Venus at the time will actually be joined by Mars and Saturn. They're quite, um, they've moved into view in the morning sky as well. And this view the same morning, March 28th, looking southeast at seven o'clock, you, you can see the three planets. Mercury is around, but it's very tough to see at the moment. It, it's very close to the, the horizon and the sky will just get too bright before Mercury gets high enough to be visible. But that said, uh, Mercury will move into the evening sky very quickly in April and will remain 
on view for the second half of April. So you have a very good opportunity spy the innermost planet, which is often called a very elusive planet. One thing about Mercury is that um, they, they often say Copernicus never saw Mercury, which is kind of not quite true. He never saw Mercury during parts of its orbit where he was attempting to get particular observations so he could um, create more accurate tables to predict its future positions. So the, re the reason is, is that from our latitudes and the latitude of when Copernicus was observing, Mercury is just too close to the horizon and very more or less hugs the solar glare. So, so it's quite hard to see at certain times of the year. It, it's normally only on view for a couple of weeks. And then once it moves back in towards the sun, it, it hides in the solar glare for a while before re-emerging again. But definitely um, by April, you should get a good opportunity to see it in the evening sky. And we'll, we'll mention that a bit more next month. The moon um, this weekend will be a very thin crescent, but later in the month, around March 12th, uh, a very good opportunity to see a particular effect on the lunar disk called a uh, clair obscure. It, it comes from the French uh, light and shadow. And it's basically where certain lunar features take on uh, a kind of familiar pattern, um, almost like uh, pareidolia, or almost like uh, just where where we see shapes in in clouds or or something like that. The same on the moon. The particular uh, angle features are lit by the sun, causes them to maybe stand out in particular relief. A couple of the more famous examples are the so-called lunar X and lunar V. You can normally see them when the moon is around first quarter or, or seven days after new moon. And the lunar X is where a couple of, well, three lunar craters are very, ba basically buttress each other and the rims when they're lit under a low sun angle. Um, it creates a kind of an X shape. The same with the lunar V, certain ridges on the lunar surface. And, and these can be even photographed with an ordinary zoom camera. Um, if, if you zoom in on the first quarter moon, you can actually get decent pictures of the moon. Some of the high end smartphones allow you to get very good photos of the moon in close up as well. And, you reveal these features. They can certainly be seen in binoculars, but the one around March 12th is called the jeweled handle where there's a 180 kilometer long um, ridge of mountains called the Juras in the northwest part of the moon or the upper left. And they, um, under a low sun angle, they can take on a, a beautifully textured appearance, like a glittering sword handle. Um, they rim a uh, lunar bay called Simus Eridum, or the Bay of Rainbows. And that's a feature, um, it's actually a flooded crater formed from a giant asteroid impact billions of years ago on the lunar surface. But the impact, um, like the flooding flooded one part of the crater rim and tilted the lunar surface somewhat at that point and raised the juras above the surrounding landscape. So really very um, dramatic feature to observe. And uh, as I said, binoculars or, or even a zoom on a camera will allow you to, to get um, a very nice close up view of this. One thing we 
hope to see this weekend, and we have seen from Balan Skellix from the Dark Sky Reserve, is the so-called zodiacal light. It, it's a glow that's seen to taper up from the western horizon on spring evenings. On, the, on a, When the moon is absent from the sky and from a very dark site, you, you can see this faint cone of light. Often the, the tip or the apex reaches up as high as the Pleiades star cluster. And, and it's, it's a, a triangular feature is, is basically where we're seeing dust in the inner solar system illuminated by the sun. And it lies, because it lies in the plane of the solar system, the, the ecliptic or the, the, is the path of the sun around our sky. The ecliptic goes through all the zodiacal constellations, hence the, the name zodiacal light. It's best in spring evenings and in autumn mornings. And that's because the, the tilt of the ecliptic with respect to your local horizon is quite steep. From uh, areas in the tropics or near the equator, you can see the zodiacal light any month of the year, but the tilt of the ecliptic varies during the course of the year from Ireland's latitude. Uh, it, it's steepest in spring, um, but it's much more shallow in the autumn in the evening sky, hence why we get the harvest moon that the moon appears to rise around the same time on successive evenings because of that shallow angle the ecliptic makes to the, to the horizon. But, but in the springtime, that steep angle um, causes the glow to appear quite high in, in the sky for us. It's about the same brightness as the Milky Way at, at its brightest point. But, but fades into the sky background. Um, we, we saw it around this time of year, a couple of years ago when, when we were doing an event at the car park be the beach, at the car, or sorry, the car park at the beach in Ballon Um you, you could see it over the mountains to, to the west. And, and I remember one time uh, being with a group um, down in West Cork, and they were, um, they brought me out to a dark site, and they said, this is fantastically dark, and I said, what's that uh, town over that direction, the glow, and they said, that's out over the Atlantic, and we realized it was the zodiacal light that we, we were actually seeing, it was extremely bright. The, the cause was, is believed to be, um, dust from laid down by comets and the grinding down of asteroid bodies over billions of years. But recently, one suggestion has cropped up that the, dust, the culprit may be dust from the planet Mars. Mars often suffers planet-wide dust storms. And because of its, it's only a third the size of the Earth, so its gravity is less. And some of those powerful dust storms may actually um, eject dust into the near Mars environment, which ultimately spreads out. And the idea um, or the theory of Mars being the dust origin evolved from studies made from cameras on the Juno spacecraft while it was heading towards Jupiter. Juno is currently orbiting the planet Jupiter, but on its way, the cameras um, were used to analyze particles that the, the spacecraft was encountering. And they modeled the trajectory of these particles and the seem to have a Martian origin. So the jury is still out. There's still a lot of debate swirling around as to whether Mars is the culprit. But definitely watch this space because it's a very intriguing theory and has a certain amount of merit. But that said, definitely find a very dark site about 90 minutes after sunset, look west, 
and you will be rewarded um, by sites of this majestic site, but, but not in our light polluted towns and cities, it's just not possible to see it. And it's even had it, it's sometimes called the false dawn when it's um, visible in the autumn, in the morning sky. And it's even made its way, um, accounts of it have even made their way into um, some historic poems uh, such as the uh, Kubla Khan. The um, last month I spoke about Leo the Lion and how to find it. It, it lies under the constellation of Ursa Major or, or basically underneath the plough. And just the saying in like a lion, out like a lamb is very apt at this time of year. And some suggest the reason for the saying is that Leo rises in the eastern sky in the evening time at this time of year. But if you look towards the west, you see Aries, the ram, uh, beginning to make a descent towards the western horizon. So again, we, we're not sure the origin of the phrase, but as the quote shows there, or as the slide shows there, the quote is a little bit different to what we're the saying we're familiar with, but there could be merit. Um, the ancients were very observant of the sky and, and certainly there is merit to them um, making the association with spring storms um, and the more balmy weather coming towards the end of March and as we get into April. If you're looking towards Aries, um, Although there's no major planets, um, naked eye planets in the evening sky, um, Uranus is borderline naked eye visibility and is in the constellation Aries at the moment. It's not near any bright stars to make it easy to find, but with a phone app, you should be able to track down the planet. It has a kind of pea green color if you're looking in binoculars and certainly, um, a camera pointed at that direction of sky, a time exposure of 15 seconds or so, you will definitely record the planet Uranus and it will look pea green in the image. And it's kind of nice to go out and try and get a snap of it because um, it's an extra planet to add to one, a list maybe of um, objects you might never have seen before in the night sky. And on to uh, Saturday night, what is visible? This is the view towards the southern horizon and the majesty of Orion is really um, dominating the skyline presently. And it's surrounding retinue of, of bright stars too. If, we, um, if you trace down from the belt of Orion down towards the lower left, you come to Sirius, the dog star. It's low altitude from Ireland's latitude means that it twinkles lots of different colors because of the, you're looking through a thicker layer of atmosphere. So there's more air currents just breaking up its light as it's traveling through our atmosphere. If you take Orion's belt and go to the upper right, you come to an orange giant Aldebaran with the V-shaped Pleiades star cluster, continue on upwards and the magnificent Pleiades star cluster. Um, there's a number of words in old Irish for the, the Pleiades. Um, basically, tra they translate as a uh, gaggle or flock, like a flock of doves. And that's the aspect that many cultures around the world saw them. Um, like as a, a straggle or a line of stars or like a little flock of um, stars clumped together. And, and it's certainly a, a, an insight that many cultures have, ha, have and 
they're the similar words and their languages translate similar to to the old Irish. Um, but even within Orion itself, you have the magnificent Orion Nebula nestling in Orion Sword, uh, Aldebaran, the, the bright orange supergiant, which is slightly brighter than its average brightness. It varies in brightness over a period of about a year, as because as it nears the end of its life, it's puffing off outer layers and losing mass, so to speak. Uh, there, there's so much to see in the winter sky. It's like it's because the that region of sky where the star, many of the stars are actually nearby in terms of stellar distances go. But they're also um, young, brilliant, white hot stars, much bigger than our sun, and burning their nuclear fuel furiously. So they 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 really stand out. But it, they stand out too because um, they're 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 concentrated in such a small area of sky. There's no other part of the sky where. You see such a magnificent gathering of bright stars, and, and that's why the, the region around Orion is, is just magnificent to behold, and it's, it's magnificent to admire. And any instrument will reveal lots of treasures to be found in the area. And it's, it's basically, uh, if you sweep up through Canis Major up to the left of Orion, you're you're following the the winter Milky Way at that point, and the military, winter Milky Way is studded with many star clusters, little knots of stars, uh, so so many superb superlatives you could use for for the view there, and. And during, during the year, um, we, we produce a calendar. Well, at the beginning of each year, we produce a calendar of what's on view in the night sky. And that's the clip of what's happening this month. There, there's a number of anniversaries. Um, Pioneer 10, the first spacecraft to voyage out towards Jupiter and return our first close-up images of the giant planet. It's now voyaging out beyond our solar system. It's well beyond our solar system. It's actually been overtaken by Voyager 1, which is moving much faster than it. But Voyager 2 is, is not um, as, as far away as that, though, because Voyager 2 did a grand tour of the four gas giant planets during the 1980s. But Certainly, um, there's lots happening during the month. Um, we hope to catch up with everyone this weekend down in Kerry. So please do uh, pop in, say hello at one of the events. Um, the clear skies. Thanks, everyone, for listening and tuning in tonight. Thank you very much, John. Um, I suppose one of the things that uh, I just wanted to do was reference some of the uh, some of the um, stuff that we're, we're going to be dealing with over the the, the weekend. Um, and whilst uh, there are there are the bookings on the system for especially for the stargazing events, the fact of the matter is that we'll be on a public beach, and weather permitting, myself and John. And I'm sure Michael Sheen and the evening will be the same over in Carl Daniel tomorrow. Uh, basically, we'll probably be there for as long as we can see stars because that's what we're there for. So um, if you have any questions, um, uh, any issues, as I said, just holler. Uh, one final point from me. Um, our objective this weekend is to make South Kerry a red light district. What I mean, what I mean by that is that if you are coming, um, don't bring a torch uh, unless 
you have some kind of red uh, plastic or uh, other material over the torch because with red light, you don't damage your night vision uh, and, and you can see the stars. With white light, uh, you blot out uh, your night vision effectively. You, you, you retrograde it for about 20 minutes. So in effect, um, how to be super unpopular at a stargazing event is to do what I just did. Put on a big white light, gets people very upset. So to reiterate, by all means, join any of the events. Uh, we have stuff going on in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, we have stuff uh, during the day. Uh, we have family events. Uh, we have a pile of people who know uh, their stuff. And we're really looking forward to sharing uh, what we cherish down here with you. So. Uh, Please feel free to come along, ask any questions, and enjoy it. That's it for me. Great. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, they could put their hand up and we could unmute you. If you want to ask John and Steve any questions or any festival questions, anything else? Um, just to let you know that the weather forecast is actually looking really good, which is very exciting because we've had to cancel a few events the last couple of weekends. Um, and um, but it could be cold. So uh, the main thing is, is dress warmly, you know, be sensible about it. Dress warmly, bring a red torch, bring a hat, bring a flask, um, all those kind of things. But anyone who's booked into any of the events, um, we will be sending emails just to let you know exactly what's going on and little reminders. And even has just said, yep, yeah, coloring sheets. So I've been actually watching a couple of YouTube videos on how to make red torches. <laughs> and they're actually not that difficult. So there's a couple, there's loads of little tutorials out there. Because I mean, obviously, if you're down in the dark sky reserve, red torches aren't that easy to come by. Maybe it's something we should actually ask one of the local shops to start selling or something. I think the one thing that um, a lot of people don't realize that if you have a head torch, a lot of those do have a red setting. So it's worth checking your head torches if you have them at home, if they have a red setting. Um, because uh, I know for myself from sailing and stuff, we always had head torches with red settings for, for night sailing. Um, and I've spoken to a few people this week who've just this week discovered that their that their head torches have the same. So um, that's worth checking out. Can I just say you can also, um, in, in my case, uh, make yourself really unpopular by deciding that the right colour nail varnish to use happens to be your wife's favourite one. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you can just colour out the bulb. Um, Make sure it's not, uh, uh, not it's not the wife's favourite one when you do so. Can I just mention one other thing? Bemi de Dungagen on Saren. We have a, a wonderful speaker there from uh, Black Rock Observatory, uh, an incredible communicator uh, and, and educator, Kivin. Uh, he will be delivering his talk, Oskelga in Dungagan. Don't be afraid, he's, uh, he's very approachable. He's really uh, a very knowledgeable guy. And myself and John will be there as well that afternoon. Uh, so if you have any queries or need help setting up a, a, a telescope or even how to work your binoculars, uh, we'll be there and uh, we'll be uh, available to, to um, to help in any way we can. So, as I say, looking forward to the weekend and looking forward to sharing what we have. Uh, whilst John was talking, I just popped out and whilst I got 21.74 on the meter last night, it's only 21.19 tonight. Um, that's only because there's a little bit of cloud around uh, uh, currently. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the, those kind of readings are just literally world class in terms of dark skies. So uh, we're hoping to share it with you tomorrow. The, the, um, when, when you were um, just talking about the red torch and that, I, I just done 
on the a lot of apps that have uh, like night light or night vision mode so you can just flick it across and you see the way it's so if, if you have your astronomy app um it just means uh your everything is red light so it protects your night vision then that way um and, and I forgot to mention the like I, I printed off some of these already, Steve. But the oh, excellent! Climaps.com they do a monthly uh, map of the sky and highlight interesting features as well to look at in binoculars. Well, Christina was saying fantastic weather, fantastic skies as well. There you go. Fingers crossed. So tomorrow night, stargazing in Derry and Han, um, uh, and uh, in Balance Kellogg's on uh, on Saturday night. Um, fingers crossed and clear skies to everybody and looking forward to seeing everybody. Good night um, Thank you for joining us. Before we go, Kira's asked a question, will the, any of the festival be online? Um, unfortunately, Kira, we well, I suppose, fortunately, because of the COVID restrictions being um, kind of over and done with, we've decided to do the festival fully offline um, this year. I think we will be hoping to run this festival again in the future, and we might look at doing a hybrid model um, at that point. But at this stage, we were really happy to be able to do some events in person um, and have decided to run with that. So I'm afraid we won't be doing any online events this year beyond tonight. Where, where are you, Kira? actually in Ireland? Because um, there, there, there is a number of other um, kind of activity. Oh, Dublin, yeah, there is. Um, I've, I've been talking to the Phoenix Park Visitor Center um, in early April. Uh, I think around the 9th or 10th of April, there's going to be observing at the Phoenix Park Visitor Center. And our, our club will have telescopes set up. I, I was talking to Leaf, the OPW person in who, who manages the visitor center. So that, that's going to happen um, early next month. Uh, and, and our club also does um, sidewalk astronomy on once a month on a Friday night in Sandy Mount and a Saturday night in Clontar. And I'll, I'll just put the, um, the club website there. No, no one minds me um, just throwing in that. No, that's great. Yeah. And um, just because there was another question there about um, different apps and things, and we'll all be downloading our astronomy apps before we go out this weekend. Um, I put in a link to our, uh, we have a blog on our website, which has um, all of John's notes from all the different talks. And at the end of each of the notes, there's a list of recommended apps. So you'll have the full list on there. So every time we put out the notes, we put a list of recommended apps and things on that. So you can just go to our website and you can download them all and read up everything before the weekend. Lots of homework for some of us, <laughs> uh, yeah. us beginner astronomers. My 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 favorite app at the moment is one called Sky Guide, uh, simply because uh, the 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 graphics are particularly impressive, and also free of charge. Well, not free of charge. You pay the initial charge, but they're they're naming uh, satellites in real time, uh, and you can really impress some somebody by by gazing aloft and saying, "Yes, that looks like the Soyuz Y thirty one. May no, no, sorry, it's the one forty one. Um, <laughs> joking. It, it, it's a superb app. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we don't have the space station this weekend. It's it's morning passes. Yeah, we, we we tried to get them, but they, they weren't cooperating this year. We're already booked. <laughs> <laughs> At least not the embarrassment I had of all the people on the beach looking for the the iridium flare a few years. Oh ago. yes. And five minutes after it was supposed to happen, I looked at the times and I said, "If you're all here again tomorrow night, it will happen again." <laughs> <laughs> Can I just mention uh, one other thing? Uh, and I know it's fully booked, but. Um, 
uh, Michael Sheehan is, is doing uh, something on, on astrophotography in, in the Skellig uh, uh, 18 premises. Um, the the get, getting information and getting tips on, on, on how to take photo, photographs of the dark skies here is something we encourage all the time because the more people who, who, who take pictures, the more it's, it's cherished and the more people uh, share it. So uh, we are constantly trying to um, uh, improve uh, the knowledge of people in, 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 in this area. And Mike will, will certainly help you with that. Uh, one other thing just to be aware of, uh, in Kerry County Council are currently involved uh, in a pretty extensive dark sky monitoring exercise which is in real time currently taking readings uh, at various locations uh, in, in the dark sky on a, on a permanent basis. And we'll be publishing some uh, links to, 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 to access that data shortly. But um, it's something that we committed to doing um, and it obviously COVID screwed things for a while, but it's now underway and the numbers are pretty impressive actually. Uh, the, the, the readings we're getting. So some good news there. So, right, so anything else, Sorla? Mary had a question about Starlinks um, uh, satellites. Um, they were, uh, I have to say that the first time I saw uh, the Starlinks, um, they, they, they were pretty frightening, uh, pretty impressive too, it has to be said, if that isn't um, the wrong thing to say, given my my interest. Um, they, in fairness, they have taken on board the concerns of um, of uh, astronomers and astrophotographers, and they have changed the angle of attack on the uh, on the uh, solar panels, which is effectively what you see as these things are going over. So even though there's an app saying they're going over. It used to be that they went across and uh, it looked like uh, a train going going across, um, advancing across the sky uh, in, um, in lines. Uh, you can't see that. Uh, certainly, I haven't seen it uh, of late. And this means that what they said they were going to do, which is uh, change the angle slightly so that the, the, the light reflecting off the solar panels isn't actually coming down. They're still up there, but we can't see them as much. So it's pretty good. I think that I don't see any other questions. Um, again, thank you everybody for tuning in. We're always delighted. It always comes around really fast. The next thing we know, it's the first Thursday again, but um, we always really, really enjoy it. Um, so thanks again for everyone to tune in and of course come and say hello to us if you see we'll all be there over the weekend um, come and say hello yeah, thanks Lovely. everyone thank you take care folks travel safe you're com coming down and uh, we'll see you over the weekend yeah I'll see you tomorrow Steve um, yes John cheers bye <laughs> thank you Annie's. bye <laughs>